to have uh, um, a few uh, guest speakers here today. Uh, so uh, we have Professor uh, uh, Oded Katz. Uh, he's an associate professor from uh, uh, TU Delft uh, in the area of public transport. Uh, he co-directs the uh, Smart Public uh, Transport Lab, which is uh, fairly newly uh, That's right. set up, right? That's right. Uh, <clears throat> and your research uh, contributions are related to uh, dynamic transit assignment, uh, optimization of passenger service operations, uh, network robustness analysis, and real-time control. Uh, his uh, PhD student, uh, last year a PhD student, Panchami Krishna Kumari. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> uh, so she uh, works in the area of uh, multi scale pattern recognition and uh, she's very interested in big data and, uh, and uh, uh, similar uh, types of uh, topics. Uh, so, so her uh, uh, dual master's uh, was in computer science uh, from KTH and TU Delft. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, you'll you start and yeah. then uh, point to that switch right there. Exactly. All right, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Great to be here. Um, and uh, do feel free to ask me questions at any point. We don't have to wait till the end. And also, we can you know, duel in some parts and skip others uh, based on your interest. So, uh, this cat's uh, working with Pancho Viet at uh, TU the Netherlands, um, uh, where we have some of these nice pods traveling around the campus as well. Um, and I will be sharing with you some of the uh, uh, work that we have been doing on on demand transport for the last couple of years and our plans as well. Um, and this is where we are, uh, that's the campus, just to give you an idea, um, with this main uh, access. Uh, just opposite computer science in civil engineering, where we have uh, the group of public transport. Uh, it's a very diverse group, people with backgrounds in operations research, uh, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, so software engineering, but also human geography um, uh, and uh, psychology. So. Um, we indeed, we are a new group, just launched actually a couple of months back with the official uh, launch event, uh, but we kind of run things already for a year or so. Um, and those are the people involved, uh, where you see a group of uh, PhD students and uh, postdocs working in different projects, uh, ranging from uh, pedestrian simulation to on-demand transport, uh, public transport management, uh, network design, uh, so quite diverse topics. Uh, and also the group of uh, professors and faculty uh, in the team. Um, to give you a bit of a flavor of the kind of things we do before dueling into on-demand transport, uh, delving into on-demand transport, so um, I think we, it's fair to say that almost everything we do is in intersection of uh, network design and assignments, analysis, operations, performance, management, and behavior uh, of passengers. Uh, and you will see this throughout the presentation. And we work closely with uh, these partners, um, which are academic, but also industry. Uh, you can see here some uh, car manufacturers, uh, consultancies, public transport agencies, and operators from uh, across Europe primarily, but not exclusively. We had a meeting yesterday morning with uh, WAMADA in Washington, DC, where we also have a joint project. Some of the projects we are currently working on um, include Transform, where we look into transfer uh, coordination and management, trying to synchronize uh, transfers of passengers using smart car data in real time. Um, real time information about uh, crowding conditions on board trains uh, and the impacts of which, especially under disruptions. Um, also, behavioral studies looking into the potential uh, market segments and model shifts in the event of uh, shared autonomous vehicles. Um, and a new project uh, starting uh, this month, actually, and which will run for five years. Uh, we just recruited five people for this one, uh, which looks into uh, shared autonomous vehicles and large-scale on-demand transport. Um, so I think in this room uh, you are familiar with uh, conflicting and very sparse evidence we have so far uh, for the impact of uh, ride sourcing, ride hailing services. At TRB this week there were I think, a couple of sessions very well attended just discussing some of the new uh, insights about those. Uh, and still conflicting evidence as uh, if whether those actually contribute or relieve congestion in places such as San Francisco. Um, and I think the evidence so far is too sketchy to actually draw conclusions. Uh, needless to say, uh, speculations about the impact of automation uh, of such services. Uh, so what um, we will show in the coming hour or so uh, are a series of studies which look into uh, modeling from strategic planning to tactical planning to real-time operations of such services. Um, and then also looking into some more empirical evidence that Panch Mi will share from uh, Didi service in Chengdu in China. 
So uh, first of all, capacity uh, planning. Uh, so this is a project with uh, Dash Railways, uh, NS, um, which came to us with a uh, very forward-looking uh, ambition uh, to um, examine the potential for introducing on-demand rail-bound services. So we typically think of on-demand services as being shuttles or uh, ride sourcing of different, source, uh, different sorts, um, shared autonomous vehicles running on the roads, but here they were actually looking into how can we introduce potentially on-demand service on the on tracks. Um, and this is the, Dutch, uh, the national Dutch network, uh, where you see not only the stations and tracks, but also the lines in different colors. And then you may ask yourself, what is the part of the network which in the future, I think 30 years ahead, we would like to keep as the main trunks, the main corridors with uh, high capacity? And what parts of the network will become um, a more on-demand kind of service? So sub-networks within this network. Uh, that's the first question. The second question is also, uh, what are the capacity requirements for such a service? How large are the stations have to be? How many vehicles will have to park there or duel there or uh, bypass the, the station? What is the capacity required from the different uh, track segments? If it's feasible to start with? And then what are the level of service that we'll be able to deliver to passengers given such a service? So what will be the waiting times? What will be the uh, detours? Um, so this is a whole series of studies, but I will share some of the results uh, from the uh, first steps. And we started with a simple numerical experiments uh, looking into a kind of fine idealized grid or uh, ring radial uh, networks and what are the consequences of having these kind of services. And I think what is important to realize is that in current uh, rail systems, the passenger has a route choice to make, right? So you can choose which line to take or to wait for where you may transfer and so forth. In this future network, uh, passengers don't have to choose because they will get a direct station to station service without having to call anywhere along the way, but the vehicle will have a route choice, right? So this pod can travel in different ways between stations, depending on the congestion that prevails across the network. Um, so you may have different in-vehicle time depending on the route that the uh, pod takes. So we looked first into small networks, uh, looking into where the congestion may arise, um, and then also uh, formulated this as a cost minimization problem. Um, I will not go into the full details, but the idea here is that we determine simultaneously both the capacity required for each station, as well as the capacity required for each link, track segments, that is, uh, as well as the flow distributions of these pods across the network, such that we have a user equilibrium solution. Uh, and you can also uh, choose between whether you want system optimum or user equilibrium solution, uh, depending on what you assume about this kind of service. Is it that there is one Dash Railways uh, kind of entity that manages the flows and then minimizes the time for the network as a whole, but maybe it's the cost of extending, prolonging the trips of some travelers, or all these vehicles choose their own route independently, uh, leading to user equilibrium. Um, so there are two ways in, of doing that, but uh, in any case, you get um, the outcomes in terms of the tracks capacities and the station capacities and the flow distribution of which. Um, and we here focus on one part of the network, uh, the northwest part of the Dutch railway network, where there is limited but some route choice to be made. Um, and we took the data from the smart card data. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a nationwide tap in, tap out system. Uh, so we can infer the demand patterns and then use them as input also into the future service. So we don't look into the potential demand for such a service, but we take the existing demand as given. And then what we found out is that for this network, uh, Actually, the capacities that we find that will be required to serve existing demand with this new service are comparable to the existing capacity. So roughly the same size stations, the same number of tracks between stations, but the bottlenecks will appear at different locations than they are today. Uh, and we can do that while uh, by having about 190 vehicles uh, and reducing in-vehicle times for travelers compared to the existing network by at least two minutes on average, uh, but at a certain cost. And this is also has political consequences. 4% uh, of the passengers will not be served by this service. Uh, and that's a decision you can make, because if you think about, you can reduce for 96% of the travelers the average travel time by two minutes by not serving 4%, but happen to travel between an OD pair which has very thin demand, not justifying its own 
service, and you may you know, just offer them a taxi. That would be cheaper uh, than offering this kind of service. Uh, but of course, it has also some political consequences uh, in terms of equity. Uh, so that's some, some, sometimes the kind of a trade-off we can make in terms of efficiency and coverage. And then we looked also into because all the values that you can imagine put on the cost parameters are very speculative. What is the cost of introducing a new uh, track kilometer of such a service uh, where we need to keep headways between vehicles down to 30 seconds? Um, and then we look into the sensitivity of the results of different cost parameters um, to find what are the break-even points compared to the existing network. And the data was actually very enthusiastic about that, uh, and they continue examining this solution. Uh, we have a follow-up project where we look into what parts of a network indeed should be served by these services as opposed to the main service. Uh, and there you can check it out later um, if you um, get the slides from the presentation. There is a video where they show a very vision of how the network should transform into kind of hybrid on-demand fixed service. So that's very long-term planning um, of potential on-demand on-rail. Uh, we can also look into more conventional uh, services which operate as first last mile. Please. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, please do. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, looking at, uh, I guess, uh, on-demand uh, rail and your, uh, your, your, uh, your, how is the setup for like passengers to request service so they'll, they'll like use a mobile phone and. Uh, Right. Uh, so we had several scenarios. Eventually, we converged into the one where we serve uh, ODs that the demand between which is sufficiently high so that you have a service which runs at least every three, four minutes. Hence, there is no need for pre-booking. Okay. That was the assumption made. Okay. And those 4% which are left out are exactly those ODs which don't satisfy that. Okay. So we don't have sufficient demand to justify that. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, as, as more people enter into the station, <coughs> exactly. So, uh, and the assumption we also looked into there was a sensitivity analysis of the size of the vehicles, uh, and we eventually used, I think, for most of the analysis, 24 passengers per vehicle. But we also looked at anything ranging from 12 to 96. And once you move up, then of course the frequency is not sufficiently high to justify such an assumption. And, and yeah. that's assuming the track switching and all, all that is set up to allow. Correct, correct. So um, we looked into um, also the different headways between vehicles that it will be possible. Uh, and the smaller the vehicles, the higher the frequency, the smaller the headways you need, right, uh, when operating the system. But even in the case of the 24 passengers per vehicle, you will still not need um, headways shorter than 30 seconds, which is already close to the range that you can nowadays do with large metro, heavy metro. So certainly for such small vehicles. Yeah. Any other question or remark about this part? Okay. So going to, um, I think, somewhat more familiar um, systems that run on demand, um, uh, where we had a, this, you saw this pod in the very beginning. Um, so uh, we have a project called WePods, uh, which looks into connecting a train station to university campus in the east of the country. Um, and this is, uh, well, not exactly a mile, it's about eight kilometers, so something like five, six miles, um, connecting the train station to the campus. Um, and um, when I first joined this project, and you know, there are a lot of people working on the vehicle concept, and the idea was that we would look into whether this can scale up to, to service. Um, I was very skeptical. Um, and the reason is that uh, this, in the context of the Netherlands, 90% of the students do this by bike. Uh, some take the bus, um, and uh, those, this is a connection where you, have, uh, you can highly predict the flows uh, and their temporal distribution. So you know when trainers arrive, right? You can dispatch buses exactly when the train arrives. It's perfectly scheduled. Uh, it has sufficient cap capacity to accommodate all the demand. We also know the lecture hours at the campus is about the same. There is a very clear temporal pattern. Uh, which is just the worst situation you can have for on-demand service, right? Because then you don't need it to be on-demand and flexible. You can have it perfectly scheduled. Um, and so we wanted to look a bit into that um, and the potential of substituting the buses with uh, these kind of small pods with 10 passengers each. And then later on see how this works for a uh, city-wide kind of service, a city of about 200,000 people uh, called RNM. 
Um, so I will show you now a short video just to introduce you to how what are you going to see. Um, is basically uh, this one-to-one -one connection, right? Uh, campus to station. Um, and you will see here the number of passengers waiting at each of the uh, terminals, uh, the corresponding waiting time, the number of vehicles uh, running on the route, and the size of the, the image of the vehicle on both terminals is how many vehicles are currently idling at that terminal. Okay? I think the best way is to click here. So we will see uh, a day, roughly. Uh, we have 69 vehicles, uh, which we found to be the optimal number of vehicles, because um, we had a simulation-based optimization for this. Uh, and then you can see passengers arriving in big numbers when the train arrives at the station, and then vehicles running back and forth, basically, to uh, discharge uh, this demand. The same goes to the campus. First, in the morning, there are fewer numbers, but then in the afternoon, when the lecture hours um, and then the, we also see flow in the other direction, but it's very unidirectional, the demand, depending on the time of day, and potentially very inefficient for this kind of service. Basically, you run empty, uh, typically, the, the trips back. So then you can benchmark this against the existing bus service and see beyond what demand level, beyond under what cost levels of this new service with pods, this would be financially viable as a substitute to the existing service, where you take into consideration both the level of service that you provide to travelers as well as the cost associated with running the service. Um, and then you can see also how it scales for a city like r &M, um, where we then need 306 vehicles based on our optimization. Uh, and what I find interesting to highlight is um, that it potentially results with very an equal distribution of passengers' waiting time across the network. Uh, because we all accept that if you live more centrally, you will ha benefit from higher frequency, higher level of service. Um, for on-demand service, that is also the case, because you're more likely to be in proximity to other vehicles, right, and other people that have demand for these services. So it results with more uneven distribution of waiting times than we have at the moment uh, with uh, scheduled service. One more thing is that um, there is a potential uh, virtual cycle for on-demand service, uh, meaning that the higher demand is, the operational cost per passenger is smaller. So the marginal cost for operating the service for increasing demand decreases, as well as the travel time and waiting time experienced by passengers. In other words, as a customer of such a service, you have an interest in more people joining the service. Assuming, of course, that supply is elastic uh, to increase in demand. Um, so potentially, there is a certain point beyond which this is not the case, right? Because maybe beyond a certain point, congestion is such that you are better off with people not joining the service. Uh, so that's probably if you continue this, if you have continued this long enough. Uh, there is a notion of critical mass or potentially phase transition beyond which you may uh, uh, have increasing marginal costs of additional passengers. I don't know if you've seen something quite like this in your studies. Uh, I, 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 I think that, yeah, it's similar to this, uh, but uh, also there's, there's the argument about how at certain high you know, demand then it makes, it makes more sense to go with fixed um, Yeah. Yes, and that has to do also with the previous point, how predictable demand is. Um, we have uh, visiting students uh, coming soon from Australia where they have experience of uh, on-demand service that is now switching into a fixed service. We hear more about vice versa. But the reason is because, well, the service was flexible, the people were not. <laughs> so basically, you know, we schedule the trip every day at the same time, the same people going to work, and then they realize, okay, there is no point in doing that anymore. We just schedule the service. Um, but it can also be due to volumes. Right, and then so the reverse case, uh, it's then uh, ambitious, right? Uh, right. I mean, so, and that can be explained in some of the situations that we're seeing with uh, various uh, micro transit companies, especially in the US, that have been uh, failing. Yeah. And also, the mirror picture is also that this, this virtual cycle for on demand is a vicious cycle for the fixed service at the same time when they coexist. Yeah. Um, moving into um, 
more real-time control aspects and fleet management. Uh, this is a project with uh, Transdev, um, I think primarily European uh, public transport operator uh, across the continent. Um, and they run also services in the Netherlands. Um, and we um, wanted to look into a service that they have, which is called Abel. Uh, I don't know if you have heard of which. Uh, it's a service Uber-like, but you can, the price is, uh, depends on how much time you allow for the service. Uh, so if you want to be at the airport within two hours time, you will pay less than if you want to be there within an hour time. Uh, so there is uh, some dynamic pricing going on there. Um, and this is um, a simulation, agent-based simulation of Matsim. I assume most of you are familiar with. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, so this is for Amsterdam. Uh, so uh, I might be very familiar how it works. Um, so uh, it's an activity-based model. Uh, we have all the demand data for the Amsterdam region. Um, what we did here is introducing capacity constraints for parking. Um, uh, because what we saw with this WePost case also that we assume basically kind of infinite parking anyway, right? Um, this can become a constraint. And then how does this uh, work together with the rebalancing strategies. So we send vehicles to different areas where we expect demand in the future and so forth. Um, so I could illustrate this, excuse me. So uh, we have the zones and we have parking data. This has been very tedious work, I can tell you that. Uh, to insert all the parking, uh, both on-street and off-street parking facilities and capacity. Uh, then here is just an illustration of uh, this is um, the outcome of a model split where we have a share uh, going for automated on-demand service in this case. Um, this is the historical city center. If you visited Amsterdam, you probably have been to this part of the city uh, where all the canals are. Um, and then we can see how it evolves uh, through the day um, and look into uh, all kind of KPIs from parking utilization to waiting times and so forth. And we did this for different rebalancing strategies, including uh, moving to areas with where you have deficit in terms of supply, moving to areas where you anticipate high demand and so forth. So, um, like the parking and the rebalancing strategies, those are all custom uh, extensions that you guys built? Uh, the parking constraints are there, uh, the, but they were not connected to any rebalancing strategies. So this was, and then we introduced several new rebalancing strategies. Yeah. And that, that's, uh, those are add-on, essentially? Correct. Yeah. yeah. If that could be of interest to you to use, then we can uh, discuss that. Yeah. Uh, one more thing that we did in, in Matsim is, uh, uh, which is not visualized here, is also allowing for joint assignment of on-demand and fixed services. So not people don't have to choose either or, they can combine on the same trip. So you can take first on-demand, then take the metro and vice versa. Uh, so we can look into, and that's actually proved to have a high model share uh, in this uh, simulation. But uh, currently Matsim only handles CV local trips, right? So Correct. Are, um, I know in, in, uh, at Berkeley they were uh, making a mock with Google, or with uh, mm -hmm. collaboration with Dr. Alonso <coughs> in the lab, uh, developing a, what was the, what was that other one called? Uh, Beam? What is it? Beam, right? Yeah, oh yeah, Matson Beam, B-E-A-M. Uh, I haven't heard of, okay. They were considering multimodal trips. As okay. Well. Uh, but but uh, you guys have I do know that there is already this function for park and ride. So that's already a combination of car and, and public transport. Okay, okay. But, but uh, not a yeah. general... Yeah, uh, correct. Yeah. Um, here is looking into um, vehicle routing and, uh, and dispatching. Um, so th this is a case where we look into uh, recent work with this TransDev uh, into how you can also along your route, uh, adjust your route in response to new pickup and drop-off locations coming in. So you allow for at any intersection to divert from your original plan uh, to pick up and then change also your drop-off plans uh, while considering capacity limitations as well as anticipating future demand. So for example, if there is a, a train station where you expect high demand to be generated at a certain time, you will already send anticipation vehicles with sufficient residual capacity given your expectations. Of course, it has also, it may fail because it is a prediction. Uh, and then we use it in a stochastic simulation to see how this will perform depending on the degree of certainty you associate with these predictions. Um, and this was for uh, an area in just west of Amsterdam, which is a kind of an industrial harbor area, where is a train station where most people come from here and then been distributed uh, around the area in office space. 
uh, and uh, then we, uh, based also in, the, in relation to the train schedule as well as working hours uh, and historical patterns, we send vehicles in anticipation of future demand and given capacity constraints. Um, and you can, uh, what we found is that, uh, excuse me, uh, that uh, it has very dramatic uh, benefits in terms of the percentage of passengers being rejected. And rejected here, we assume that if you have to wait more than 10 minutes, you, you reject the trip. Um, so those people, have, this share of the market has been reduced dramatically, uh, while also reducing average travel time and waiting time very significantly. Um, but at the cost of increasing, as you can imagine, uh, vehicle mileage. Um, so there are some externalities generated by doing that. So how, how, is the, how do you do the end anticipation? So we looked into historical data. So we assume that we have historical data. In this case, we like simulated a year, let's say. Um, and then we use the information about this empirical distribution in the choices we make based on a certain percentile of this distribution. And you can choose whether you want to plan for the expected or the, whether you have a more you know, risk averse policy of planning for the 80th percentile. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, kind of, uh, but, uh, it's, it's not like a scenario two. Right? No, it's more of a risk management strategy in that sense. Yeah. And then you can look into uh, the benefits it has in terms of distributions of waiting times and detours. Uh, and as you can expect, where more sophistication you have, very the more uh, you benefit uh, at the cost of inducing some externalities. Um, now I'm going into service planning. Um, and, and thereafter, we'll hand it over to Punch Me. Um, where we, uh, well, service planning is a, well, on demand, what are you talking about service planning? Uh, so here is, um, we work with an operator in The Hague in the Netherlands, uh, and the idea is how can we make our service more flexible, yet scheduled at the moment, with the idea that this will potentially move further in that direction. Uh, so thinking of this as a spectrum and not as, you know, binary thing. Um, and what we see from their current bus services is that they have very uneven demand profiles. So uh, this is also two random bus lines, uh, and you can see the different directions that there are typically parts of the segments of the line which have very high demand. This is capacity, and some which are really underutilized. And then the question is, how can we basically cater better for the demand we observe uh, by uh, having more flexible operations? So uh, the idea here is to uh, introduce additional what we call virtual lines, meaning those are lines that uh, are not you know, directly in the schedule or uh, in your plan. Uh, you can generate them either you know, daily, offline, or maybe even on the fly. Here we focus just still on the tactical planning, so not real time. Uh, and you can either do short turning, so you can run you know, back and forth on this segment of the line. This proves to be the high demand segment. Uh, but often what we see in cities, of course, is that we have very directional demand, right? So we don't really want to drive away back, maybe. Instead, we can also have deadhead into another line and run in the high demand direction of this other line. So we can also afford, uh, also allow for this kind of deadhead in between different lines. And the approach we have taken here, this was presented at TRV as well, uh, is to uh, select a few what we call switch points. So we first have a process for generating locations at which we allow for the generation of new lines which combine segments between these switch points. So you can draw new lines, and these segments between the switch points can be either on service or deadheading. Right? Um, and then we solve um, this problem, uh, which requires developing a specific heuristic for solving that. Uh, but the basic idea is that we want to minimize passenger waiting times, passenger in vehicle times, the end the fleet size requirement, which is a function of the cycle time and the frequency, and the personnel cost. Uh, while satisfying all set of constraints, for example, we have to serve all the passengers that want to travel, we should not increase the number of transfers in the system and so forth. Please? So what is N here? Uh, N here refers to the fleet size, so the number of vehicles assigned to a certain line. And this line can be one of the planned lines or a virtual line. Um, this is what we found out for the case of the Hague. You, the, the grayish lines in the background are all the planned lines. Uh, and we then solve what is the optimal number of vehicles to serve those. 
Uh, and then we have all the blue and red, which are the new vehicular lines, so-called. Either short turning, as you can see, or interlining, as we call it, deadheading. Uh, serving some parts of the lines, which have uh, the most lucrative parts of the uh, demand market there, or uh, allowing to combine things uh, for directionality. And what is interesting about this is that you can generate uh, really hundreds of vehicular lines. In our case, I think we had about 500 of those. But in fact, we find out that only eight of them are actually needed. And that's very handy, because as an operator, you don't want to have hundreds of virtual lines and you know, tell the driver which one he should drive. Uh, so for this to be feasible, it's good that we have uh, a manageable number of lines to actually operate. And we can see the consequences for passenger waiting times, for vehicle running times. Uh, the fleet size remains the same. Uh, and it's also uh, a flat, um, optimal space, if you wish, uh, not a single point in the sense that you can have many different allocations of the fleet to these virtual lines that will all result with the same cost, uh, which is handy when you have to want to have different kind of solutions for operational reasons. And then moving on into the demand patterns. Um, and we, in the Smart Party Transport Lab, we work uh, uh, frequently with smart car data from different countries, including from Washington, D.C., but also from uh, The Hague and Sweden. Um, and we look often into clustering those to generate OD matrices that we can work for both uh, fleet management and uh, strategic planning for network design. Uh, we can also look into passenger reliability across the network. So here we use a tap in, tap out to find how reliable your trip has been, not in terms of vehicle punctuality, but in terms of uh, the predictability of your trip. And how much did this uh, diverge from your, uh, you know, what you would have expected from a travel journey planner. So it can also be in minus because Maybe you know you were not expected to make this transfer, but you ran, or your vehicle, the first vehicle was early, so therefore you made it to an earlier departure of the next vehicle, and uh, therefore your travel time has been shorter than you would have anticipated. Uh, fortunately, most of the people experience positive values, uh, and we can see also where does this happen. So we can find the kind of uh, hot spots of where reliability uh, deteriorates. And since two years ago, uh, there has been a, a, a national bill passed in Parliament which requires that all operators in the Netherlands, uh, all agencies, measure their performance in terms of passenger reliability as opposed to vehicle reliability. And we start having some empirical data also about these on-demand services. Uh, this is an example from the Netherlands where we start to have log files for these services. Uh, and we can look into what are the most uh, high demand connections and whether those substitute existing public transport links or complement existing public transport connections. Unfortunately, we see that often that substitutes are supposed to uh, complement and then we have competition for the main high demand corridors. Um, some of these services have, you know, cannibalizing each other as well. Um, but this is a small data set uh, and we now will see some results from the DD data by Fanchmi and also how it can be used for traffic state estimations. There you go. I should give you a mic, I believe, right? Okay, I'm loud enough. Let's go for it. Ah. Very difficult. Okay, I can hold it. Uh, so I think Audit have already told you a bit about fleet management, how it can be useful. But for fleet management, one of the things you really need is the demand patterns itself. And so we were really lucky to, well, I think everybody got lucky last year when DD open sourced their data, which was one month of data. And uh, oh, yeah. So what they open sourced, maybe, maybe for people who don't remember it's travel request data so they had order data where they wanted the for people who don't know about Didi it's like Uber but in China and uh, so what they had was the starting location and the end location and the driver who took that service so they had the travel request data but they also had the taxi GPS movement data and what we wanted to do check was that this was a really rich data source they had two to four second uh, GPS accuracy, as well as uh, the like one month of data, and they had around 200,000 orders per day, travel requests per day. So it was a really rich data source. So what we wanted to see was, is this uh, demand that they had, was it predictable, or is there any patterns there? Oh, 
So this was the area that they have. So that is Chengdu, it's in Chinese. But that big area is the actual Chengdu region. And so the small black area that is like nine by nine kilometer of GPS data, that is uh, more than the size of Amsterdam, as uh, that's what you said, right? Yeah. So they had GPS uh, locations for that region, but they actually had order data for the bigger rectangular area. So that is one of the bias within the data itself that the GPL. So there is order data is uh, is only available for taxis that move through that box. So there is some orders missing. So for all the taxis that travel outside of that black uh, area, that order is not included in the data. So this was an inherent bias of the data, but we still wanted to check the. So they had almost 6 million uh, GPS locations, which is quite a lot. And the, uh, the grid and that is the order uh, origin and destination. And the GPS traces is that small box there. So we wanted to do some kind of spatial clustering because 6 million points is not possible to work with. So what we tried to do was we tried to use both the distance metrics. So we wanted to create really compact regions. So we had a distance measure as well as the actual number of rides. So we wanted to have compact in terms of the flow within a zone and as well as the distance we want to have. So what we tried to do was we checked for like zero to 100 clusters. So clusters here means zones. So here you see this is an example of, uh, so what we did was k-means clustering using both distance metric and the flow metric and see if we can create uh, optimal number of clusters. But in machine learning, usually there is no optimal number of clusters. So the more you go, the better the metric goes. But we have to create, uh, find a suboptimal number of clusters. So we pick 50 because that is not really in the, so we didn't want to pick there. So we wanted to pick somewhere here. So we took 50 clusters. Uh, so this is the zoning in the end we had. So it looks something like this. This is for the whole data set. If you aggregate the one month of data that you have, you can see that is the number of arrivals per zones in that whole one month of data. And this is the departure. And it's like in the city center, there is more. There's almost 300,000 arrival rights per uh, the three, three months of data, sorry, one month of data. And here, what you see is a. Uh, uh, <coughs> Deficit and surplus. So deficit means the more greener it is, means that there is more departures going from there. So zero deficit means that. So the most bluest means you have no arrivals there, but it's hundred percent departures. So people are going away from that zones. Not people are not coming there. So this was our spatial clustering. So we could create OD metrics essentially for each. Uh, time slices you have, right? Because you have these now these spatial zones, and you can create the number of uh, rights per day for each of these zones. So what we tried to do was we tried to create OD matrices for three different cases. So we wanted to aggregate it for one day, one whole day. But we also wanted to go more in depth. So what we tried to do was to get hourly OD matrices. So we wanted to check also how the demand changes through time. So we took one hour, and we also checked daily. So we had uh, so one hour, but 24 OD matrices, essentially. So you have 50 zones, so you have 55, 50 by 50 OD matrices. And we wanted to see if these patterns are reproduced. We didn't know how the uh, d demand patterns looks like, so we didn't want to. Uh, so we wanted to do unsupervised clustering to see how the patterns look like. So that's why we put hierarchy clustering. I will tell a bit here about it. So this is essentially what hierarchical clustering does. I'm not sure if everybody can see it. But it creates a tree. It essentially tells you how your data is uh, divided. So here you can clearly see two branches. and. So this is the example of the uh, aggregated hourly patterns. And what you clearly see is that there is a morning peak. Uh, let me show here. 
So this is the class distribution. What you see here is that from 7 o'clock to, I think, 4, they are all seem to have similar patterns, which is essentially people are going towards the center. And that makes sense. So people are either going towards the work. And in the evening peak, so that is the up, more people are going away from the center. So there were, we picked five patterns because there are clearly five, uh, and it is more easy to interpret those results. So we had a off-peak period as well, and that is usually from midnight to five. There are still demand, but it's much less. And we also found that there are these uh, like really, really high-peak transition point. That's what I call it. And that is mainly when you go from morning peak to evening peak, there is this high region, so these ones. So these are really, really distinct classes. And so that means these patterns are really predictable as well. So we could do this for daily patterns and as well. And what you see is that there is clearly a weekday pattern. So Monday to Thursday seems to be clustered together. And then you have Fridays, which looks really different. So it's probably people who are going to party. And then the same for Saturday and Sunday is diff clearly different. So there seems to be really distinct patterns in the data. And I'm we. Sorry, but why are there two Sundays? <laughs> so essentially, maybe there is more. So this was uh, one or three Sundays. Yeah. So there are complete. There, so there was some split there as well. Yeah. Yeah, because we have two clusters to be able to see the daily patterns. Uh, so just look at the number of people. Sure, but the thing is, you, you can check the number of pickups is also distributed across spatially, right? So if you just look at the number of picks up. Uh, you have one created by k-means clustering. Yes. And not just the hierarchical clustering. No, so the k-means clustering was used to create the zones, right? Yeah, now you have zones, you can look at the zones. Within, within zones, you can look at the number of pickups in those zones. Huh? So that's essentially what you do here as well. So for in but those. Need clustering. So the pickups move up to 50 points, right? And you have 50 or 60 as you try to open up. Right. So it's not that you need to wait to open up, it's what you need the number of pickups. And the number of trips. The number of trips that flow from one zone to the other. Yeah, but again, do you need clustering to be able to see each one? You need at least some easy classification. Yeah, but how would you classify it? But because you don't know how many patterns are there, right? This is unsupervised, right? Yes. You're creating your own rules to be able to say clusters. So I use the OD matrix to look at if there are patterns. So because otherwise I can just uh, cluster together weekdays and weekends. But okay. this gives you more distinguished yeah, but, but from the data. Into, so you're using a supervised method to get the zones, and then you use unsupervised method to get the clusters. K-means is also unsupervised, right? And you're saying 50. So you're setting a number. Uh, so you, so we picked 50 based on the data. So it's not just we picked 50. So we looked at the flow metric and okay. the distance metric, okay. and we picked so 50. And then that 50 zones, we use it for computing the OD metrics. So you're supervising it. Do you call it? Yeah. That's what, that's what so, it, it, so, so once you have the 50 clusters, then it is just static zones. We consider it as static zones. So instead of, for example, instead of having postcode, we are letting the data essentially zone it. And then these zones are used instead of the GPS coordinates to re reduce the dimension of the data. So the spatial clustering was just for reducing the dimension. Okay. You agree? <laughs> we can, uh, we can <laughs> talk about it later. Yeah. Uh, so there was also patterns in, in the daily patterns as well. Uh, and then we, of course, if you want to do um, short-term prediction of demand, you shouldn't just aggregate weekdays and the times together. You also should be able to see patterns, hourly patterns as well. And that's what here we try to do. And what you can clearly see is that maybe this is an example. So here, this is uh, the different days. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. Some of the hours of the day are usually similar because they have similar demand patterns. So just uh, aggregating out 
you cannot day, say the whole day of Sunday looks the same. All of so this also gives you a more distinct, and this can be really be used for short term predictions as well. I have a question here. Do you have an error like of a daily pattern in terms of the prediction error? Like, for example, your model may be more accurate on you know, Sunday or you know, less accurate on Monday? Do you have a look at that? No. <laughs> so we just first wanted to see if the demand patterns were predictable. Okay. And if you could see, we wanted to use it for prediction. Okay. But uh, I will give an example on, yeah. So, so what we really were trying to see was if we can really understand the demand dynamics of the city using the uh, data. So we could really see distinct morning, evening, and afternoon peak, off-peak periods. And so we think it can be used for feed management if just based on time and day as well. And it can be also be used for short-term demand prediction, especially the last uh, type of clustering. Now, there is one data that we didn't touch, which is the taxi GPS data. Uh, we didn't do, yeah? Sorry, I'm just wondering, so, so when you're looking at those uh, you know, OD demand results, have you ever seen that specific data set and said, I recognize the same set of data mm -hmm. But it, yeah, but there is a is there a tourism season in the Chengdu because we only have data for November. I know, but it's always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's really <laughs> Yeah, so that is that could be something interesting to look at. Oh, I have to go up. Yeah. So so the now we had some GPS movements. We didn't do uh, the next study that I will talk about for uh, DD data itself, but that is one potential region I think we could use DD, and that is for traffic state estimation because usually, essentially, you have these GPS coordinates of the taxi movement as well. And that should be able to also tell you about the traffic state. Is there congestion? Maybe that's why they took longer time to travel. So here, what you see is, uh, the, for example, that is the city of Satanda. It's a city in Spain. And the second picture you see is the traffic state of that city at 4 o'clock. So there is a heavy congestion in the center. So what we want to check is that if you have uh, these traffic GPS coordinates and you can you do the traffic state estimation, like that, we could also do it for short-term prediction. Now, how we want to do the short-term prediction is, uh, so that Satanda city have around 4,000 links, and this is like a, for, this is a traffic state for 15 minutes aggregation, so for 15 minutes it looks like this. Now, if you stack up all of those, that is essentially, I think, 400, no, 200 time slices or something, so that's essentially the dimensionality is, 4,000 into 200, so that is really high dimensional data. So we wanted to reduce it by doing clustering again. So what we do here is a spatial clustering. So instead of having 4,000 links, here you have five different zones. And this zone is based on the speed. So here you have homogeneous speed. So this is essentially one zone which is connected. And this is based on, a, I'm not sure if you guys know, but macroscopic fundamental diagram. So the idea is having these zones which have, which can be uh, represented by a single speed or flow. So we try to create this, but in uh, time as well. So what you essentially have is traffic states for one day that Henda network can be represented if you stack up uh, the traffic states on top of each other, right? So you have the latitude, longitude, and then you have the time. and then you get a 3D network, something like this. So you have now a 3D state of that network for one day, and then you can get 3D zones. 
So now essentially the 4,100 into 48 slices are mapped into 10 3D zones. That is huge uh, data compression. And then what we tried to do was do, a, was sa do the same thing that we did for DD, was to cluster these daily patterns into different classes and see if there are patterns that we could reproduce. And what we found out was that, yeah, what we found out was that, for, for example, for Amsterdam, for 30 days, we could reduce it to four classes. And we were able to predict uh, travel time, short-term travel time, with 80% accuracy. So 80% of the time, we were able to predict travel time with less than 10% uh, error. And that is huge data compression. So we were essentially able to compress months of data into a few uh, archetype pattern. And so we see a lot of potential for this kind of data. And we want to see if you can use the same thing for also DD data. And that is the next step, at least. Yeah? yeah. So you use the speed that you are to predict travel time? Yes. So why do you tell time to make the classes? Because uh, how do you find homogeneous travel time region, sir? How do you find homogeneous speed time? Are you using the mean only? Uh, so essentially each zone, oh, sorry. Each zone is represented one by one mean speed. And we are using that mean speed to find the travel time. So you're saying if I have a speed of 10 on a highway versus slow from you know, 3, that will be in the same cluster? No, so that is different. So here we are only considering urban roads. So, so highway, I think there we have to consider relative speed instead of uh, just, uh, of yes, yeah. So we, you shouldn't just consider uh, the actual absolute speed. Then you can have relative speed regions. There, there, then, then it makes sense to have homogeneous speed regions, right? Well, the errors of travel time estimation don't speak that. So, are you, are you, by this given cluster, are you estimating travel time? So, essentially, what we do is that, so given the current traffic state, we find uh, which class it belongs to, and for that class, there is a is 3D map associated with it. Yes. So there is a special 3D model for that class. And then we use that 3D model to predict the travel time. Does it make sense? So, so essentially, we do 3D trajectory and find what is the travel time, the computer travel time, and also observed travel time, because we have the ground truth, and then check. And for 80% of the, uh, because what we did was we considered 10 parts. And we did number of iterations for all of them. And for 80% of the cases, they had a less than 10% uh, error, travel time error. So just using this mean average speed. Uh, I can send you the paper if you're interested. Yeah. 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 Any other question? Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, I can say uh, um, maybe briefly about the uh, four digit piece of planning. Um, there's a European research project where we, um, the idea is to move beyond what we see with mass and light models. Um, it allows us to, as you've seen, uh, basically say, okay, what are the precise requirements to offer a certain level of service? These kind of uh, rebalances are in our case of space. So they're very useful for these kind of dimensions. Uh, but we see that some of the issues that I can imagine also running into our, uh, first of all, the simply fully controlled mid, uh, predefined mid size as opposed to dynamic supply flow. So you cannot, at the moment, have co evolution across supply and demand in, in Maxim. Um, so the idea here is to move beyond that into uh, look into the co evolution of uh, both sides of the system, uh, dynamic pricing, that's another uh, point of interest, uh, impact on congestion and demand for parking. Uh, but also in um, insert more about user preferences and strategies, and that goes both for customers as well as uh, drivers of super-like services. Um, and finally, we want to introduce the time dimension, so looking into how all these services evolve over time, and whether this kind of phase transition critical mass notion is there, and shareability potential. 
Uh, so this is Gaps audience, so that's okay, but busy for how many years, but maybe we can find out something more. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 back so I think there's there's a lot of potential in that. But I'm still going to keep in mind that I'm going to the operator side of the application. With the day and the day to day. Can you do both? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're trying to make sure that it's both. Have you run into some consistency issues? We haven't encountered. When they, when they have code of looking all that's all kind of stuff I think they're very happy yeah yeah but, uh, but uh, based so the uh, the mission we have to be on a special mission for us to uh, if they uh, meet any concerns that issue like that uh, and what we were trying to uh, evolve uh, over the multiple days was uh, the, uh, the, for the operator to learn the, what, would, what would be uh, an optimal uh, user and operator constellation right uh, because when you're using it technology or product, you, you, don't, you don't really know what's the uh, Yeah, exactly. So, so one of the things that I maybe worthwhile to mention that is, I think, different between the American context and the European context, is that uh, in the European context, well, first of all, the starting point, obviously, is different in terms of how the market looks like, uh, but also that uh, it's subject to regulation, much more than uh, in the US. And uh, <coughs> the, I think the trend is moving towards what is called in Europe mobility uh, contracts. So the idea is that you don't only send, because in, in Europe all public council services are tendered. So you have, you know, they can put out a bid and then companies uh, uh, bid to vote. And then you have to run a service based on some uh, specifications. And the idea that these, these will also include the on-demand part of the market. So you have to offer a mobility service and then you can decide how you fill it up. What parts of this service you offer fixed and what parts you offer on-demand. Subject to some standards of service that you have to fill up, where you get bonuses or penalties. Uh, so the different kind of context and how you have integrated design of the services. Thank you very much. You're welcome, of course, with any other questions later or uh, offline. Thank you. Yeah.